How many computers in here do you think we've got multiple processors in? Okay. Um, yeah, I've, I don't think any of them have got multiple processors in the way that I would think of multiple processors. My edit machine has two Intel processors in it, physical chips. Okay, so you're, you, you define a multiprocessor system as having two physical chips. That's what I'm thinking. What, okay, or we could also take multiple cores where it's the same thing on the same piece of the silicon. Okay, so you've got two physical chips being two physical processors. Which machine, or multiple cores, which machines in here do you think are multiprocessor? We'll just use that term to refer to both of them systems. Okay, well, I reckon these new Macs here have got multiple yep, cores. They're all not. quad core the machines of various guess, types. Uh, your phone, maybe? Yeah, the phone will. But you've got all these vintage machines around. So starting over here with the Apple Macintosh LC475. Well, let's just say that's only got one processor in it. There's also a PowerPC laptop under there, underneath the surface, underneath the multiprocessor motherboard. So the surface is multiprocessor, which is sitting under there. The Atari STs, that one. We could count this as, but we'll say it isn't. Why could we count it as? Um, because the keyboard's got a CPU in it. Okay, yeah. So it's got an intelligent keyboard. So the CPU's got a microcontroller in there which scans the keyboard and then sends over a serial link the key presses to the main CPU and so on. So there's a separate processor in there. So we've got the Atari Falcon under here. How many processors? Uh, I'm, I'm guessing that there's a trick here, so I'm going for two. Yeah, so this has got two processors in it. It's got a 68030 CPU and it's also got a 56001 DSP, both Motorola processors in there. I uh, don't think any of that Acorn stuff, which I know relatively well. Yep, so they're all single processor systems, although the RISC PC did have two processor slots, so it could have had a separate 486 put in there, unless I managed to get hold of the one existing Hydra card in, that enabled you to have multiple ARM chips, so that's single processor there. Original IBM PC, single processor. BBC Micro? I think if that's a special one, then possibly, but if it's the standard one, then no. So that is a special one. That's actually got uh, what Acorn called their tube system which uh, if you watch the videos on Steve Ferber talks more about this, but they initially released the second processor, not co-processor, but the second processor for the system, which was a complete another computer inside there with a 6502 RAM and so on in there, 64K of RAM, which shows how old it was. And that was then connected to the BBC Micro, which had its 32K of RAM and its 6502 on there. The master turbo I've got over there has that built into the motherboard. And so that's technically a multiprocessor system. It's got two CPUs in there. I've just got two CPUs of the same type. Running at slightly different speeds, but two CPUs of the same type. Apple II, single processor, the Acorn and the Amiga and the Atari. Again, the Amiga, I think you could possibly make an argument that it was a multiprocessor system, but not in the way we're thinking about it. Why have we just done that? Um, well, it shows that there's, there's two ways you can design a multiprocessor system. So your system at home, your editing system, the Macs on here, they have two processors um, that are of the same design, two Intel cores, or two cores, should we say, or multiple cores, all of the same design. Um, and those processors are identical. And they're used pretty much to do any of the tasks and things. It's what we call a symmetric multiprocessor system. So each CPU in there can be allocated by the operating system to run programs, it can answer I.O. and things and just do anything that you need it to. So you can split the tasks up um, to do different things. By comparison, the Falcon and the BBC Microsystem, the BBC Master Turbo, they have multiple processes in them and you can use them for general purpose tasks. But the general idea is that the processes do different tasks. So it's an asymmetric multiprocessor system. So, for example, on the Falcon, the idea was that the 68030 would run your, the main system, run everything it's doing, and then if you wanted to do some sort of processing that would benefit from the DSP chip, the 56001 that's in there, you would offload your processing onto that, feed the data in it, it would process it, and it would feed the data back out. So it's effectively running as a separate subsystem and so on. Um, on the BBC Micro system, the idea was is that you'd have the 6502 chip, that's in there as normal, running the I.O., drawing things on the screen, handling the keyboard and so on. And then you'd have your main processor that would do most of the processing work and occasionally would tell the other processor to load a file into memory or to tell the other processor to do things. So you can design a, a multiprocessor system in two ways. You can either have it so all the CPUs are working on the same task. And in that case, they probably will all connect to the same piece of shared memory and they'd all 
work on the same task and they'd all talk to the same bit of memory and communicate along that. Or you can say, no, I'm gonna have different processes, perhaps of different types, different speeds, doing different jobs. So multiprocessor systems have been around for quite a while in various different guises. There's a sort of suggestion here that the idea of parallel is the more mo modern way of doing it. Surely with things like GPUs, we're kind of, we've got hybrids now, right? Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a, well, the thing is, yeah, but I mean, the GPU is generally being used for a specific task, um, things, whether that's graphics processing or Bitcoin mining or whatever it is you want to do on it. Um, depending on whether you're wanting to make money or lose money. Um, and I can let you work out which one of that is going to do which. Um, surely we're using multiple cores purely because we ran out of horsepower on single cores. Um, so why are we using multiple cores? Good question. Um, so the thing is, you want to make the problem run as fast as possible, and you've got two ways to do that. You can either make the computer run faster, for example, speak faster, you get more words per second and so on, and you get it going and you do computer more doing more and 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 faster and faster and faster and faster and faster. The problem is that is you get to a point where you can't actually push the computer faster. There's a thing called the power wall. That's the point where you can no longer dissipate the heat away from the CPU. We actually hit that quite a while ago, but you're able to reduce the voltages used on the chips, which meant that you could get a bit more and then do it again. But apparently we're getting to the point now where the voltages are so difference between the logic zero and the logic one is so low that actually you, you could take it any lower you'd get leakage between the transistors on the chip itself and so it's not possible. So you can push the speed in one way. The other way you can make the problem, make the program run faster is to split it up into multiple chunks and do them all at the same time. So one way for example to make sandwiches faster is that you butter the bread faster, you put the filling in faster, you put the bread faster. The other person is you get two people doing it and then it takes them the same amount of time to make one sandwich but you've got two people doing it so they make twice as many sandwiches each time they make a sandwich. Same with the computer, we could either make the computer processor faster or we can have multiple cores each working on part of the problem at the same speed and then we can have them produce the problem, produce the result faster. To do that, we need to be able to break the problem down into multiple chunks and execute each of those chunks separately, which is one problem. You need to work out, can you break the problem down? Can be quite simple. If you're, say, um, processing an image, um, you want to, say, make it 50% the brightness, um, then you can process the top half, process the bottom half separately, do them at the same time. You halve the time it takes to process the whole image. Other tasks are harder to break down because you need to work out how you want to break down the algorithm to run over different things. Asymmetric and symmetric multiprocessor systems aren't really competing for each other. It's not, this is how we used to do it, this is how we do it now. You would find that there are multiprocessor systems back in the 80s and 90s. Parallel processing was a big thing in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, people were looking at parallel architectures for doing all sorts of things. In fact, one of the things which describes how parallel systems work, Flynn's taxonomy was created in 1966. So the ideas have been around for a while. I think it's more that for a lot of things, when you, you've got a task that you want to do in different things, symmetric multiprocessing makes sense. For other things, having an asymmetric system, whether that's your DSP, your IO processor, a GPU, a TensorFlow type thing, and so on, makes more sense like that. So how you design a multiprocessor system is, very much based on what you're wanting to do. What are you trying to do with it? I mean, Flynn's taxonomy is an interesting thing because you then get some really weird processor types coming up. So you can either have a, a system which has got a single instruction stream or multiple instruction streams and a single data stream, or you can have multiple data streams. So you end up with a single instruction stream, single data system, or multiple instruction stream, single data system, single instruction stream, multiple data system, or multiple instruction stream, multiple data system. So a modern multi-core CPU will actually at times behave like a single instruction stream system, at times behave like a SIMD, single instruction stream, multiple data stream system, and at times behave like a multiple instruction stream, multiple data system. And we end up with these all being used at different times. The easiest way to think about it as a single instruction stream, single data stream processor. That's the sort of classic model of a processor. You've got a set of instructions that your program's executing. And you could think of these flowing through the CPU one after the other, okay, with the occasional branches like water flowing through a stream. If you look at one point, the water flows through at that point, that's what the instructions are doing. They're flowing through the CPU. And each of those instructions is probably going to be loading a value from memory or doing some processing on the value that's come from memory and then putting it back out to memory. So if we say, I don't know, let's say it's rendering 
3D graphics, you're going to be doing lots of matrix multiplications and things on that that you can then pull the data in, do the calculations and write out the new points and so on. Now what Intel did around ooh, late 90s, they introduced what's called the Multimedia Extensions MMX and that was followed by um, SSC, SSC2, AMD's 3D Now and various other things that do different things which basically add what are called single instruction multiple data instructions. So these instructions are still a single stream of instructions that say we're going to add something, we're going to multiply something, but rather than just acting on one piece of data at a time, they can act on multiple pieces of data. And if you think back to that 3D graphics, you for example will have your XYZ coordinates for um, say your shape, um, and you normally actually store that as four coordinates because you have the X, Y and Z and then you have a, a one in the vector because it makes the math slightly simpler. And so you might actually then call that, need to multiply that by a matrix. And with a SIMD type instruction, you can read those four values and read the four values from one column of your matrix and multiply them all together, which is four separate operations. But if you can use an SIMD instruction, you can do that in one operation working on four separate bits of data. So it multiplies the first pair together, the second pair together, the third pair together, and the fourth pair together, all in one instruction. So they added extra bits, new ALUs, new designs for doing things that enable them to have these instructions. If your data is structured, the data you're processing is such that you can take advantage of that, you can get some significant speed boost because rather than doing four instructions, you have to do one. Um, but you're taking advantage of what's called data level parallelism. The data, the processing you want to do enables you to do those instructions on multiple data options at the same time and you get some sort of speed up. It works for some tasks, 3D graphics for example. For other tasks it's less useful and so you don't benefit from them. But the other thing our CPUs can do is that they have multiple cores and modern CPUs, the Intel i7, AMDs and so on, um, are all multiple instruction, multiple data things. So they have separate cores, each of which are running their own stream of instructions, so they're on different bits of the program or different programs altogether, processing different bits of data, still a single stream per processor instance, but unless it's an SIMD bit and so you can have multiple data streams. And so you have them running all of these things. And that is pretty much what people think of as parallel processing, multiprocessing and things, is you've got multiple CPU cores, running their own programs, processing their own set of data. So we can build up different things. And they've been around for years. I mean, we've had various different types, symmetric, asymmetric. The different ones of Flynn's taxonomy have been around for a while. That leaves us with this weird one in the top right corner of the diagram, which is the multiple instruction stream. So you've got multiple streams of instructions acting on a single data stream. Yeah, they're weird. Not many of them exist these days. I think the most prominent example that I've heard of, um, I've never actually had to program it, more's the pity, is the Space Shuttle Guidance Computer. Three, two, one, zero, and lift off of Space uh, Apparently the Space Shuttle Guidance Computer uses a multiple instruction stream, single data stream machine. And perhaps one of the reasons you might want to do that is that it enables you to, say, do multiple calculations and then get some sort of fault tolerance, perhaps, out of it. Touchdown. So you can build parallel processing in different ways. But the one that we're perhaps most familiar with is that we've got multiple CPUs in our computer, whether they're physical chips, physical cores, as it perhaps used to be, or they're multiple cores on the same piece of silicon. And if we're doing that, we need to make those multiple processors do useful things. So the simplest thing we could do is get the operating system to schedule multiple programs, multiple processes across each of the different CPUs. But that enables us to run multiple programs very good, but it doesn't really give us any speed up in terms of running a single program to solve a single task. And to do that, we actually need to break the problem down into multiple chunks and execute a chunk of each of that problem on each of the different processes we've got available to us, whether that's 2, 4, 6, 8, 32, however many we've actually got to, to deal with. So we need to break our problem down into multiple what are often referred to as threads of execution and run them on different CPU cores. It produces that same A1 so that he can decrypt the message and read it, right? So Alice maybe wants to send another one. So she's going to tick this KDF function again. She's going to produce a new key and A2. Right, she's going to send that to Bob. He's going to tick this receiving function A2. Now Bob wants to send a message, so he's going to tick...